We are live. Well, hello, everybody. Happy Monday, May 18th. Uh, live with you today from the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber webinar series. We have an exciting panel today, guys. I can't even wait to get started, but we're more excited because so many businesses are starting to open. The phase one is beginning. And um, we thought this was the perfect time and opportunity to introduce um, what we're gonna talk about today, which is health and wellness and everything COVID we need to know from the front lines. So we're excited about the panel that we have with us today. Um, we have um, Jeff Dye, who is the president and CEO of the New Mexico Hosp uh, Hospital Association. We also have Dr. Uh, Beato, who is the executive director of uh, health policy and international um, uh, and, and international health at UNM Health Sciences, and uh, Jim and Maria Derniker, who are small business owners, and we're going to talk about that, but they've also been out on the front lines the last couple of months, so lots of good stuff, but before we get started, I want to share with you guys a big shout out to our sponsor this month, New Mexico Mutual. Because of New Mexico Mutual, it has been possible to bring you this webinar series, informative topics that you guys have asked for, that you guys have reached out and said, do you have any additional information you can share with us? And one of the ways that we collect that information is through our survey. This survey is still out there and we're still collecting data on it. It's important for us uh, to be able to connect with you, the community and our membership. And it's very easy to do the survey. I like to say five minutes, five questions. And we really hope that you take the time to do that. And you can find us at www.ahcnm.org. Right on the main page, it says participate and survey right there. You can also click on the links up top where it says COVID and all of those uh, great little initiatives that are happening, it's on all those pages. And of course, it's pinned to the very top of our Facebook page here where we are live today. And so again, five minutes, five questions. That really helps us to narrow down what you guys are needing within your business and um, how we can help you reopen and uh, make sure that people know that you are open. And, um, and, and uh, moving forward, uh, we are excited because there's a lot of different topics. So hearing from you guys really helps to guide us a little bit. So that's a little bit of the housekeeping out of the way. And it's just exciting. I don't even want to, I don't even want to wait anymore. So we're just going to start um, on my screen the way that we go around. And it looks like, um, uh, Jeff, you are at the top on my screen. So if you could just uh, take a minute, introduce yourself and what you do in the community. Hi, and thank you for the invitation to the program today. Um, I am the president of the New Mexico Hospital Association and been with our organization for 15 years and in a prior life I was a hospital administrator for 25 years in small rural communities, most recently in Socorro, New Mexico at Socorro General. And um, needless to say, I'm looking forward to the topic today. We've been totally consumed with the COVID world right now and trying to look beyond it, but uh, Anyway, we'll get into other information. Wonderful, thank you, Jeff, and welcome. Uh, next to next to him on my screen is Dr. Christina Beato. We have two fiery Latinas with us today, so. <laughs> Not going gonna, right, girlfriend. <laughs> we're gonna start with you, Dr. Beato. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you, and thank you again for allowing me to share this afternoon with you. Um, and. Jeff is absolutely spot on. Uh, corona, Corona is all I hear about. And it's neither something we're wearing on our heads or the beer we're drinking, so it's not good. Um, but anyway, I hope that I can answer questions and I hope I can sort of talk a little bit about what our experience has been so far. And I feel like um, we have done real well. I think people are quite aware and uh, the awareness of this virus and how to do precautions are pretty much ingrained in our communities now. And I think folks are taking good care of themselves and each other. So I think with that in mind and with that attitude, I think we can start sort of normalizing back to the regular operations in our lives. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, um, I'm 100% hopeful that you are correct. Um, and so we're excited to make sure to share all this information out today, which brings me to um, a unique a couple that is on our uh, guest panel today. Not only are they business owners, but they really have, um, during the closure of business, been on the front line. So uh, Jim and Maria, if you guys could please introduce yourself and just give us a little bit of your background. 
Of course, I go first. The best always go first. He will go second. <laughs> of course, Maria. So, Maria. Um, I am uh, the owner of True Rest, the float for the Beast Spa in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We've been open since 2017. And related to COVID, uh, we had to close our doors on March uh, 17, actually. Uh, we have to send all our employees back home. But at the same time, um, I'm a registered nurse and I felt like it was about time for me not only to be a business owner, but to give back with my passion, which is being a nurse. So that's me and this is my husband. My name is Jim Rudiker and uh, obviously her sidekick, another fiery uh, Latina that I have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, but I've been a physician assistant for a bit over 20 years. I currently work uh, in the emergency department downtown mostly. Um, and obviously I've been uh, dealing with this uh, coronavirus just like my colleagues here. And uh, the, the, the fight isn't over yet. There's a number of things that we need to do. And it's been difficult for us to balance the uh, medical approach to this as well as our business uh, mind on this as well to, to do what's right for our customers and do what's right for our community. So yeah, you guys definitely have a little bit of a, a unique uh, perspective coming from both the, the health side and the business owner side. So we're going to definitely talk about that, get into it. But I want to uh, go ahead and just jump right in and, and start with Jeff. You know, uh, obviously, Jeff, there's a lot of information out there. And sometimes it's just this overwhelming amount of information for the public to disseminate between what is truth, what is false, what is fact, what do we need to do. So you have obviously been working uh, tirelessly the last couple of months with the hospital and figuring out um, what it is the public needs to know. So if you could just start us off with what you have been going through the last couple of months with your organization and tell us a little bit about how you guys are working directly with um, the coronavirus and COVID in general. Well, um, my perspective will uh, be a little bit different than Christina's for sure because I think she's a little more in the trenches related to the direct healthcare aspects of this. So um, we represent 46 member hospitals. So I'll speak more from an organizational perspective of what our hospitals are dealing with. Um, and we were also um, businesses, of course, and, and uh, you know, well, I part of the commercial structure of our state and it had the impact of uh, COVID and closures in general has an impact on hospitals, but specifically hospitals have had a restriction on elective procedures that they've been able to provide. And uh, that's been a particular problem and an issue. But like most things related to the, the virus, it's, it plays out very differently in every hospital. So as I mentioned, we have 46 member hospitals small, rural, large, urban, uh, behavioral health facilities, long-term acute care facilities all across the state in different settings. And so just as we are hearing different stories in Farmington and, and um, you know, uh, let, let's say some of the less impacted places like Rio Oso, uh, so far as COVID goes, the organizations are also unequally uh, impacted. So. I know, uh, for instance, last week, the hospital in Portales just had their first COVID patient. And uh, lo and behold, it was an uninsured, undocumented immigrant. And so we were having to come up with what are the state policies and what's the potential for the hospital being reimbursed for that patient and uh, learned a few new things of what some of the options were with state and federal funding for that. Uh, whereas our member hospitals in Farmington and Gallup, as you are well aware, are just being inundated and are, are very much challenged and in, in the fray for COVID patients. But then probably the bigger issue for the bulk of our members is the cessation of services. And for two reasons, patients are leery about going to healthcare settings in general and they're deferring care we're trying to get the message out that people should not defer chronic, their chronic care needs or their emergency services and should get care when it's needed. 
but people are leery of going to the hospital. They think that's where the sick people are and they don't wanna to go to where the COVID patients are. Uh, many of our hospitals, as I mentioned, don't have any COVID patients and those that do have all of the precautions in place for separation of pain patients. And uh, so th that fear shouldn't be there. But on the other hand, we've been precluded from doing certain services because of the uh, restrictions on elective procedures, which we can talk about. So that's sort of the overview. And um, I know that you've uh, heard of the federal funding for hospitals that have come into play for some of the CARES funding. And, uh, but it's nowhere near the amount of dollars that hospitals have seen in a shortfall in their lost revenue. So. Uh, we can get into more of that if you like. So um, thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for that information. Um, I'm taking some notes because there's some things that I think that are um, super important. There was a two or three bullet points that I want to come back to um, in regards to how people are feeling about services, deferring services, what's important, what's not, that kind of stuff. Uh, because that's a question that we actually get is, you know, they need some sort of a surgery. Is it really elective? Is it not? And, and of course, the fear of people going to the hospital. So we'll follow up on a couple of those uh, key points. But I want to move over um, to Dr. Beato now. And I, uh, you know, kind of the same question. Um, I know, like Jeff said, your, um, you know, how you view things in the world is probably a little bit different um, from being a doctor doctor to the administrator side or what have you, but what are you noticing the last couple of months, um, how you're interacting with your team, your organization, and uh, what is some of the information that you believe we need to know? Um, thank you, Sharon. Sharon. Um, first of all, the last two months have been uh, extremely challenging, I think, for everybody. Um, and hospitals and medical providers and nursing providers are no different. We've had to adjust very quickly to an evolving, very dynamic situation. Um, we knew very little about this virus at the beginning and there were numbers all over and the reports coming out from our peer nations um, and reports that we put on more faith like the ones coming from Europe, it was devastating families, communities, economies, and countries. So um, the policy, at least that we started internally and, 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 we, and we saw it clearly across the board nationally is prepare for the worst case scenario and hope for the best. Uh, policy of hoping for the best is not good. We always prepare for worst case scenario. The reason so many elective uh, and many of them medically necessary surgeries had to be deferred is because we were predicting based on the best models available at the time that we would have about as a devastating surge as we saw in other countries. And um, the projections starting from New York City all the way around coming to the state of New Mexico were not different. They were very concerning projections. So we have a duty to our community to get ready for the worst case scenario, which means we had to have the availability of beds, particularly ICU beds, because we do not have medications to really treat this. We do not have a vaccine. All we can do when people get really sick is right now supportive care and now thank goodness some uh, drugs that are uh, for emergency use as a, as a trial sort of drug. So our focus went into really changing a whole system, an enterprise of healthcare delivery to focus on an emergency delivery system with very sick people. And for the first time, healthcare providers having to don very complete personal protective equipment because of the way that the virus transmits and we didn't have a good idea of how fast it transmits, how lethal it could be, and all these other confounding factors with it. Fast forward two months, thank God our projections were wrong. Thank God a lot of the national projections were wrong because that means a lot more of our citizens are alive. Um, now that we have a better idea of this virus, now that we have a better idea of how it behaves, now we can start focusing back on taking care of 
the people that are sick that have not gotten better. <laughs> Unfortunately, diabetes doesn't go away. Hypertension doesn't go away. Mental illness doesn't go away. Everybody still needs care, cancer treatment. So we were doing critical operations. We were basically focusing on emergency. We now feel good enough to know that we can provide that emergency surge and we need to get back to taking care of our people on an everyday basis. I do hope people feel safe uh, because I have never seen cleaner hospitals <laughs> than I do now. It's like I've never seen cleaner stores. I've never seen cleaner post offices. It's just amazing how, how much this has progressed in a good way. So, and we need to keep it up. We need to keep that up. Um, I also believe that it's critical to pass the message of do wear masks when you're outside. And it isn't because you need it. Really, masks are to protect those that will get sick among us and get very, very sick. Masks are so that if I'm sick, and because I, I'm, I'm healthy, thank God, I may not feel this COVID very much. I may feel it like a bad cold or a bad flu, but God forbid um, if my father were still alive and he was 96 at the time gets this, it's a, not a pretty picture. It would be devastating and lethal to my father and it would just kill me if, if I knew that I was the one that caused that. It's the same thing. If I caused anybody to get sick and potentially die from this disease, that would be a horrible thing for me to live with. So out of, out of concern for your family, for those that are aged in our communities, for those that are really, really sick and their immune system isn't as strong, we have a duty to those to wear those masks to help protect them. Um, eventually, we're gonna have to live with COVID. It's not going away. It's like other viruses that do not go away. I am very, very uh, firm in my belief that we will have a vaccine and it will be the va fastest vaccine ever made in the history of mankind. It's already in phase two trials. I mean, the production sites are being set up. I've never seen things move so fast in my life, which is very good for our communities. It's very good for our state, our businesses and our country. So that is moving full speed ahead and, and, and lots of people are involved that are very capable people uh, who do a lot of this day in and day out and they're combining forces. For, for the first time in my uh, career, I've seen uh, competitors unite and combine forces working together, which is something that is so refreshing that when the chips are down, Americans say, put our differences aside, put our competitive edge aside and let's work together to find a solution. So that is very positive. I'm gonna go back to something my abuelita used to say, wash your hands when you use the restroom, wash your hands before you eat. If you sneeze or cough, cover your mouth and use a tissue and then throw it away. Those basic steps would prevent so much of what we're seeing. This is a virus that we can beat. This is a virus that uh, we know a lot more about. And this is something that in families and communities, we can certainly conquer. Um, and I can tell you, we need to start getting our people taken care of. Please don't be afraid to call your doctor, set up an appointment, do a phone visit first if you feel unsure. Do a televisit if that makes you feel, but get the care you need. Get the care you need because I'm very concerned of all the hidden untoward consequences of folks not getting the care they need for two months. I mean, I know people are still having appendix issues. I know they're having GI issues. I know heart attacks and hypertension are out there. I know strokes are, we need to take care of our people. So, um... First of all, thank you, Doctor, for all of that uh, very positive message and information. And um, we, uh, I, I took quite a bit of notes because we all do have that abuelita that definitely shared with us some of those messages. Um, and, and we 
you know, we hope that now they just become more apparent in our, in, in the way that we're going to be moving forward in our new way, our new world. Um, and so we're going to get back to some of those here in just a little bit. Uh, lots of good information. I want to jump over to uh, Maria and Jim. Now you guys have really just been on the front lines um, for the last, whatever, two months or so. And um, so before we talk a little bit about um, the exciting news that you can reopen, I'd like to talk a little bit about what you guys have been going through the last couple of months. Um, I know that you've been inside the hospitals, emergency rooms on the front lines. So if you could just share with us some of that information. Well, I, I reiterate a lot of what the doctor said that one of our main concerns in the emergency department that we're seeing now is people who have put off healthcare that they needed because of fear of coming in and being exposed to the virus. And I think all of us are trying to figure out what I'm referring to as the balance between prudence and panic. And we don't want people to panic, but we also want them to be prudent. And that means that they need to go and get the health care that they need when they need it and not come in when, you know, when you've had back pain for 12 years to go to the emergency department doesn't make sense. But contacting your physician about that and finding out whether or not you need a visit is important. So we want people to get the health care that they need and do it in the proper way. Use the emergency department when they need it. They shouldn't not come to the emergency department because it's important that they use the resource when it's needed, and that's why we're there. And we've added a whole number of different procedures that changed on a moment-to-moment -moment basis so that we can protect all the patients that are in the department as well as ourselves. So again, it's always coming down to that balance between prudence and panic, and we don't want people to panic, but we want them to be prudent, and we want them to use our resources because that's right there. You're muted, Shannon. Maria, say, yeah, we're still all getting used to this technology. Uh, Maria, the same for you. you you've been working out there um, on the front lines as well. What is some of the, the stuff that you've experienced personally? And, you know, just the big question out there, since you guys really are in the emergency room, what are some of the different ways, different precautions that you've had to take to protect yourself? Because you don't know if somebody walking in is, is has it in is contagious. I mean, oh, same thing that my husband explained. Um, you know, I I 100% agree with what he was sharing. Um, also, it comes also to what you do as a family, as well, because we have a child. <laughs> so once we found out that you know about this whole COVID and then we were going to be exposed, we have to make a decision as a family what to do so we can protect our families as well. So uh, the first thing that I did, because I'm the main one of the family, I sent him to the spare room. So, <laughs> so I kick him out of our bedroom and he's back to it. So he was a good boy. <laughs> so we have to reassess. We have to reassess the way that we were engaging as a family. We have to reassess the way that we were engaging with our um, friends and our coworkers as well. And I mean, we're blessed that we were able to have a lot of uh, equipment, protective you know, equipment. So, I mean, I have never felt unsafe. I feel that I was well taken care of uh, so I could take care of everybody else. Do you, don't you feel the same way? Right, I mean, it's important for people to understand that we're, we're not done with this. I mean, it's not like, oh, we're over. We have, you know, passed the first phase and now we're moving to the next next phase. And it's, it's also interesting in that, you know, we have made such amazing advances in medicine. And even in the time that I've been in, the advances have been amazing. But the most important tools that we have against the virus are such basic things. Distancing, washing your hands, covering your face, being aware of your environment and making sure that you keep it as clean and the high touch areas clean. It's very simple, basic stuff that are the most powerful tools that we have against this virus. We actually Hispanic people, we were born for this because since day one, we use bleach for everything. I remember like you say, my abuelita was bleaching everything. I mean, you smell like bleach everywhere. So, I mean, I'm trying to sound a little bit different, but I'm different, so yeah. <laughs> so just wash your hands, like, you know, Dr. Christina was mentioning, just continue to do those uh, everyday things that we know 
what to do and how to do it. So well, I really appreciate I really appreciate everybody's humor because I guess you know everybody deals with things a little bit differently, and uh, it's always nice to see the positive side of what everybody's doing. So I appreciate that so much from you guys. I want to move back over to Jeff now um, for for a few minutes. Some of the, as I was taking notes, some of the things that we we're talking about is you know, um, and I, I we heard it from from Dr. Beato and also um, from Maria and Jim, but. Tell us a little bit about how hospitals, what are some of the best practices, policies that may be changed or have upgraded? You know, I, I believe that um, all three of you mentioned people were kind of maybe holding off on certain surgeries or thinking maybe something wasn't as bad and not realizing how important it is not to put it off. So I, I think maybe the, the question is, you know, what are some of those things that have been put in place to really ensure their safety? We want people to be getting medical treatment. So share with us a little bit about um, what, as, a, as an organization, um, some of those best practice recommendations have been. Well, uh, uh, Shannon, of course, you hear the magic word PPE, personal protective equipment. And uh, on the front lines, that's what all the providers are all about right now trying to protect themselves and trying to protect the patients. And I think, uh, you know, we talk about public masking and so forth. Of course, in the healthcare environment, the, the equipment needs are really critical, especially when you have multiple patients that providers are taking care of uh, back to back, next door to each other. And, and that requires a lot of use of personal protective equipment. So, um, you know, I, I think you've heard some wise advice from the governor and others publicly about um, not overusing the magic N95 respirators, for instance, because those are really the things that are being used clinically by surgeons and nurses and uh, in the clinical setting. So general protection in the public with cloth masks seems to be uh, better than nothing. And it's not a, a, a perfect solution, but it goes a long ways to, to reduce community spread. In the hospital, we're talking about uh, spread, you know, obviously between patients and, and much more close proximity. So we're really using a, a lot more gowns, masks, gloves, and face guards, all of that equipment and the amount of change that that is required to go through between patients um, we have what's called a, a burn rate calculator that many of the hospitals are using, tracking what the burn rate is of how much PPE they're using so that the hospitals and the Department of Health can gauge what the need is and uh, what we need out of the stockpiles and, and what the Department of Health and the governor can go get for us and what uh, is needed through our normal supply chain. So it's there's a lot of... Uh, uh, logistics to the whole process, uh, just creating uh, around PPE. And then that's not even discussing the, the concepts of disinfection in hospitals, which of course we all strive to do, but um, then there's special precautions for disinfection. And uh, our, our doctor on our panel could give us a better idea of what all the details are on that. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the cleaning that has to happen and a, a room has to remain empty and cleaned for a certain number of hours. And then uh, all of those processes uh, are added to those logistics I mentioned. So that's another element that's going on. But I will tell you um, the, the struggle and the challenge that hospitals are facing. It's not about equipment. It's not about supplies. It's about people. And uh, obviously, our patients, our people that we serve, but our staff is a limited resource. And so there are serious concerns about uh, uh, staff being infected by this virus. And, but beyond that, just uh, their mental health, their well health, sure. and their ability to take care of their patients on long shifts. Um, I have heard in some of the settings, especially in places like Farmington and Gallup, um, some of the anecdotal experiences that some of the caregivers there um, have seen, uh, frankly, more death than they've seen in their whole career. And I, I just think that's an amazingly sobering concept. We're talking about taking care of our healthcare workers, but 
I don't think we begin to imagine the burden that they're bearing on behalf of our communities. And it, it's really pretty phenomenal. Yeah, it sounds like there's uh, go back uh, getting back to what uh, Dr. Beato said is the it, it, the need for <clears throat> mental health, mental health care, especially for the front line. Jeff, will you just really quick walk us through? Um, I know that um, you know all most well all hospitals have emergency rooms, uh, and some people don't know whether they should go to the emergency room or not. And but let's say that they make the decision to do so, they have a, a, an emergency. Uh, what what is different today than it was two months ago when entering an emergency room uh, during this time? Well, uh, first of all, a quick clarification: not all hospitals do have an emergency room. So our specialty hospitals, psych hospitals. Um, behavioral health and uh, hospitals do not have an emergency room. And um, so, but your normal general acute care hospital has an emergency room and, you know, Maria and Jim, that's, that's their place of operation and uh, the new procedures for intake for patients. Um, I will say, you know, what we're hearing and what's in place is first of all, uh, make a call first. Make a call to your primary care physician. Okay. Uh, don't, don't just go to an emergency room. So that's the balancing act I think that we're at. We, we want people to get their care. We want them to go to an emergency room if they have an emergency. But we need people to be cared for at the right place at the right time. This is an age-old problem uh, in healthcare in that... Um, you know, folks see the emergency room as a focal point in their community and they go there for everything. And pre-COVID, we, we have a problem in our healthcare system is that many things could be seen at other locations besides an emergency room. And the, the particular challenge though, admittedly that we have right now is uh, FQHCs, the rural health clinics and, and all of those are, are really limited as well. So there aren't as many care location choices for patients, but call your doctor, uh, be wise about what you access and when you access it and uh, do some self-diagnosis, but uh, you know, your, your own temperature, check your breathing. There are a lot of, there's a lot of guidance on the Department of Health website about understanding your, your health and your condition. So people need to educate themselves. But then when you go to the hospital, go to the emergency room, understand that you're going to have different hoops to jump through. You may be, uh, you have your temperature tested and go, you will go through a screening of questionnaires before you get in the door, asking what your condition is, but, uh, you know, to, to, again, trying to be safe for the patient and the caregiver. And then once you get into the facility, uh, most of our facilities, uh, you're, unless it's a dire circumstance or an end of life situation, you're not gonna go in with your family. You're not gonna uh, be allowed to go in with, with everybody to sit with you in the waiting room. In fact, there may not be a waiting room. There may not be any sitting. There'll be an ability, uh, the goal of the uh, facility is to try to uh, you know, we call it metering. We talk, we talk about standing in line and only so many people get into Costco at a time. We're trying to meter how people get into the emergency room and get their care given so that everybody's not jammed into a room and infecting each other. I mean, it seems kind of common sense, but it takes a lot of uh, mechanisms to make all that happen. And then, of course, expect to see when you're in an emergency room to have folks until... Uh, you really know whether you're positive or negative and what your underlying health condition is versus is it COVID or non-COVID, there's gonna be still a lot of cautions of the staff wearing all of that PPE. And, uh, you know, especially for, if you're not a frequent user of an emergency room, you, it's sort of mind boggling sometimes. Or for kids, you know, a kid becomes kind of scary. You, everybody's gowned up. It's, it seems like a scary situation but it's all precautionary. 
So uh, lots of good information there. And I think that, you know, one of the questions that had come in, which was, you know, how, how, how do we visit emergency rooms these days? I think uh, the most important thing to take away from that is maybe we don't, you know, right before um, the first week of March. So this would have been for me the last couple of days of February, I was very sick and hadn't been to the doctor in a very long time. And even at that point uh, before, you know, we were really knowing what COVID was, uh, it, it's all virtual. You know, you can call your doctor. You can set up these Zoom uh, uh, conferences with them. They, they have a series of questions they ask you. They go through, they really help you um, do some of that diagnosis so that you don't have to come in. So I think um, it's learning the new way of not just uh, the world, but the technology and the medical world. And it, it is a way to keep people safe. So thank you so much for sharing that information. I, I think that most people should really um, heed that. Uh, find yourself a, a, a physician that you can contact, make appointments with. That would be a, a lesson I think to take out of this. I want to move over um, to Dr. Beato because something you said earlier, and I think uh, we've had a couple of questions on it, and just kind of in general is, um, <clears throat> you touched on it briefly, what really is uh, the status of finding uh, a, a medication that can help with this. Uh, can you give us a little bit of the comparison? You know, um, we, we've heard it all. We've heard this is, you know, for some people, it's a really bad cold. For others, it, it could be deadly. And for others, they don't even really feel it. So tell us a little bit about that and then a little bit about um, what we can expect in the future with, um, you know, what, what it might look like in 10 years. I know one time influenza was a big deal. So, so explain that process to us um, and the public. Um, well, you brought up influenza. Let me tell you that even with a vaccine in the United States, we lose about 20,000 people minimum average. Those are not hard counted numbers, but that's a ballpark every single year. So my hope is that we do have a vaccine because that's the best public health tool that we could have to do um, herd immunity and mass uh, vaccination programs. And that's what's being worked on. There are many medications. Uh, some of them are antibiotics. Some of them are anti-inflammatories. Some of them are um, antivirals that are currently in clinical trials. You've heard of hydrochloroquinone. That's used very commonly for lupus and um, multiple sclerosis. I mean, uh, uh, multiple... SLE, systemic lupus and rheumatoid arthritis patients, as well as given uh, prophylactically when you're gonna take a trip overseas where there's malaria in the region. Right now, um, that medicine alone hasn't proven to be very good, but that medicine taken with an antibiotic called erythromax or erythromycin early on when the disease is mild is showing some promising results. There's an antiviral that you probably may have heard about called remdesivir, which um, is a fairly new drug. It's made by only one manufacturer who's combining forces to be able to create more of it. Uh, that shows some very promising trials um, later in the disease and um, towards the, when people are in the ICU, very, very sick. So that one, is now uh, being given out by FEMA to all the states to be used. And here in New Mexico, we have received an allotment, which is very good for our patients. And it has been distributed around our state so that it's available for patients that are very, very sick. Uh, there are very few, but at least we're starting to get some. Um, in terms of a vaccine, I am very hopeful that in a year there will be a vaccine. I mean, we're in phase two already. That's amazing. When you consider that three months ago, uh, we were just learning about what this is. <laughs> uh, it, it's really remarkable. And I think kudos to a lot of great scientists and public health people and federal people and state people. I mean, our country deserves kudos and lots of that we learned from other countries in Europe that sent a lot of their information over. Kudos on that. We learned a lot from South Korea, Hong Kong. I mean, it, it's this is a worldwide problem. This isn't just unique to us here in Albuquerque or New Mexico. It is, that's why it's called a pandemic. It is every, all continents, but Antarctica are dealing with this virus. 
We also know that come summertime, viruses don't tend to be so active. So being outside and in the heat will help minimize and people are outdoors so they're apart from each other. So they're not all congregated in one little room. What I think COVID is gonna do to our daily living is teach us two very key things that haven't been in our lives at least the last two decades, which is patience and time. You're gonna spend a lot more time waiting in lines, a lot more time doing things than you ever did maybe when you started walking. <laughs> you took time for that. But really, we need the days of uh, processing things fast or moving through fast through uh, uh, throughputs and stuff, those days in the near future are gone. There will be lines everywhere you go. There will be distances everywhere you go. There will be a turn. You have to wait for your turn. You just can't walk up to a store and walk in like you did in the old days. You can't go up and say, I want this. We're going to have to wait in line until we get better tools to control and, and, and finally conquer this virus. So I think time and patience are two things that are going to be extremely useful as we adapt. I know there's been a lot of stress. I know I've had a lot of stress because your daily routine is disrupted. That's minimal compared to what we're having in the front lines dealing with losing patients and when you lose them real fast. I've heard stories of uh, individuals that are in the younger side, 30s and 40s, but very sick. They're already with comorbidities, meaning they have a lot of illnesses, but they come in sick in the morning and by that afternoon they've passed on. That's how fast this virus has worked. That's the unusual part of this virus that is so hard for us in medicine to deal with. It's hard to deal with death, but when we see patterns and when we know what to expect, we kind of are a little, a little more ready to deal with that. When we see somebody talking to us and they seem okay and that afternoon all of a sudden their oxygen bottoms out and they can't breathe and you lose them, that's, that's something we're not used to. So there's a lot of emotional, mental trauma happening to our providers right now. And it's happening because it's so foreign to us, first, to have so many deaths in one scenario. Um, and two, we've not seen anything like this before. So those two things, I think we need to be paying attention to because our providers in New Mexico, we need to keep them and we need to take care of them. And it's hard to recruit in our state. So anything we can do for mental well-being, to help out in any little kind word you can say, or help out bringing a dinner to their family, or watching one of their children if they have childcare issues, anything you can do to lift a little load and show a little kindness would go a long way for folks that are going through this. And the patients and families, some of them, some of these families cannot be with their loved ones when they pass on. I don't know about you, but when my father passed on, nobody was going to separate me from my father. So I cannot imagine the pain that some of these families are in. And so they need our support and anything we can do for them to help them with that mental guilt of not being there when their loved ones passed on. That is very hard on people especially when it's so culturally ingrained with you as it, as it is for us in our communities and also for our Native American brothers and sisters. So I think we need to be very cognizant of, of the wellness components. At the same time, it's giving many families an opportunity to bake together, to sit down and eat together, to go on walks together, to ride bikes together, I think there is also a silver lining here that we need to be taking advantage of. Um, you're seeing parents having to do some school teaching for their children. It's interesting, the new appreciation they're gonna have for teachers and the new things that they're gonna learn and for kids to have that interaction with their parents too. I think there's some positive things here that we can also build on. I don't think it's all this negative 
there's a lot of negative, but there's also some positives. And, and we will overcome this. We already are. And we will come out stronger. And we will have learned a lot better for the next time it happens. And let's hope it doesn't happen in our lifetime. But next time, just like we were ready to be able to do vaccines better this go around, this, we wouldn't have been able to do this in 2003, the vaccine. And, and I can tell you that when I was working, because that was still being done with chicken eggs. And now we have a whole different medium that we can move them a lot faster. So I think there's a lot of positive things that we need to look at and start looking up and realizing we're a lot stronger than we think, but we need to show a little kindness and we need to just lend a hand to those around us. Thank you so much, Dr. Beato. That's such really great information. Again, I'm taking notes so we can do a recap at the end. Um, <clears throat> it, it, there, it's just so much, um, so much happening. And I uh, just want to draw attention really quick again to one thing that you said, which was the mental health. And I think it's just the, the patience and kindness that's just really going to get us through everything right now. Because uh, everybody is going through COVID differently. Some, some people are not affected. Some are heavily affected. Some people don't really understand it. So um, I think that patience and kindness is the way that we can deal with, with everybody moving forward. Um, so Jim and Maria, I want to ask you guys um, uh, real quick here. You guys have have, um, you know, left your medical professions uh, for the most part when you decided to open your own business. So I'd love for you just to give us a quick uh, minute on what your business is and why you did that. And then let us know if you guys are a part of the phase to reopen. Well, we, we opened up a float spa with, you know, we both in medical background, we wanted to do something that obviously was a, a business that would help us uh, financially, but all, more importantly, we wanted to do something that would also extend our interest in, in healthcare and making people healthy. And the float spa is an excellent way to manage. And one thing in particular right now is stress. And with all the stress going on right now, floating is definitely an excellent way to manage stress. And there's good clinical research to show that uh, stress management is important and flotation is very effective against stress. Uh, it's also good for things like chronic pain and things of that nature. So it's a, it's a great way to do uh, a non-medicated approach to these uh, basic problems. It doesn't supplant healthcare. It, it's an adjunct to healthcare that's uh, being provided to people. Are you guys reopening or what is your plan for reopening? Yes, thankfully, um, as of May 19, tomorrow, we have decided to open in different stages. So tomorrow is going to be stage number one. Um, we have decided only at this time to allow two clients for therapy. So we could have up to 50, you know, but we won't do that. So we're just going to take it slow. It's like, you know, we all are mentioning, it's an evolving process. This is not going to go away. So we just have to figure out what's the best way to offer our services to the community. Um, so, yeah, so we're opening for current clients and members. And perhaps in starting in June, we're going to be opening to the rest of the, uh, the community, which is new clients. But also talking about mental health, and to the front lines um, workers, you know, some like us. One of the things that my husband and I, we have decided is to donate over uh, 100, 100 free flow sessions to all our healthcare workers. So it's our way of saying um, thank you for being there. Thank you for staying, you know, and holding, um, the, 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 you know, uh, the, during this situation. So yes, it's over $10,000 that we're just giving back. And we want everyone that who needs it, even if we pass the 100 number, if you need it, you know me, call me, I'll get you in. <laughs> Maria, how can, how, can, uh, how can frontline workers find you and how can they schedule that appointment with you? Yes, um, just call the spa, um, you know, it's the 505-832-7014, or just Google online our website, True Rest Float Spa in Albuquerque, shoot us an email, and we'll, we'll, we'll get you in. We'll get you in because we do know for sure that uh, what we offer does help, and 
we need it. We, as frontline um, workers, we do need it. It's about trying to find that mental balance somehow again, so we can just uh, get back to being ourselves and give more uh, to others. Yes, Dr. Benito says, you know, I've had uh, tears with my colleague on my shoulder, and this is just another way to kind of reach out and help them. So um, Maria, we'll share that information too um, on this post, your, your website and phone number. Um, so before we leave guys, I wanna just go around really quick and I wanna just close up with um, maybe just words of advice from your expertise and your uh, field and what you um, have and what we have to look forward for forward to so i want to start with jeff and just say what advice do you have um for um you know from from your expertise in hospitals and and uh, what we need to look forward to and, and how do we proceed forward um in regards to um you know how we kind of move out of covid but i know that it's part of our lives but how do we move forward well um you know we've already hit a little bit on the idea that we are going to be living with covid for a while and so I think there's a mental adjustment to that to realize, and Dr. Beato mentioned some of the impacts of that, we're going to have to adjust our lifestyle. Um, on the other hand, there are some, I think, some positives. She mentioned really interpersonal positive uh, results, but I think there are other positive results technologically that we should embrace and, and move on with. Um, one of those is telemedicine. There's a lot of folks that are saying this pandemic is the thing that will put telemedicine over the hump. And so where we've had maybe limited um, adoption of telemedicine on various fronts for various reasons, whether it's just the mechanics and the technology of it uh, versus the payment for it, we're all learning like we are right now that you can get on Zoom and see people and uh, we've, we've learned how to push the buttons. We know how to do it. The technology is not that hard. And uh, so I think uh, we will find that there would be a, a whole lot more healthcare being delivered uh, through electronic means. And that's good for a lot of reasons. It, it's, it's an equalizer. It, it, it allows people to have access to the system when we talk about our big state and our geography. And it allows uh, folks to have uh, access to uh, providers that are in limited, uh, a limited resource. It makes good use of uh, provider time as well. And hopefully better use of uh, personal patient time because it's less time arranging for uh, appointments or sitting in a waiting room or getting to a doctor's office. So it's potentially much more efficient for all of us. And uh, the other thing I would mention is it's, there's all of this will be, I think, a, a big game changer just for uh, commerce in general and the folks that are members of the chamber of uh, how to do touch-free uh, interactions for payments and uh, less cash passing hands and more ability to wave a card in front of a device instead of putting it in and out or handing it to somebody. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're just, I think we've just not begin to see what all the ramifications are on that front. And hopefully we can capture the best aspects of the technology and make the best use of it. So I think it's all about um, preparing for the long haul. And I've heard it said also that, you know, this is about a marathon and not a sprint. And we need to just adapt for that and pace ourselves and, and, um, you know, embrace the, the positive changes uh, the best we can and work with our health officials to uh, see the process through. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, again, some great notes I'm, I'm taking and we're going to share with, with the public. Um, Dr. Beato, in, in closing, I'd love to, to just, um, I've been taking a lot of notes, uh, what, what you've been talking about, but one thing that um, has come up, if you could just uh, take us out with, you know, uh, it seems to be a disease that's affecting, uh, you know, an, an, the older community, our elder community. Um, and I, and I realize that there's people with underlying issues that, you know, have a, have an adverse reaction as well, but we haven't really talked about um, children and keeping our children safe. Um, so if you could just take us out with um, a little bit of info on kids and, and how, you, you know, what we can, what we can share and how we can make sure that we're protecting them as well. Um, I think you you basically protect your child like you would 
yourself in, in this situation. Make sure the child washes their hands. If they're sick, you stick, keep them at home. Children are great vectors. We're not seeing a lot of sick children with this. What some states, particularly in New York, have seen about 15 of them is um, an autoimmune disorder that is similar to something called Kawasaki in children. And these children are having COVID positive antibodies. In medicine, that's called casualty. It means we have a disease and we see this, but we don't know if that this, meaning the COVID, actually caused that. Because um, it's, for example, if you look at what's happened in the last two months, we've had the deaths in the hospital that had strokes or MIs, those that had COVID, the cause of death wasn't the stroke or the MI, it was COVID causing blah, blah, blah. So until we have more data, that casualty is sort of not giving us a clear picture. Children we know, thank God, are not affected like those in older age are being affected. That's why the focus for this particular disease needs to be nursing homes, congregate living, those that are um, elderly among us and, and immunocompromised, those that are very, very sick with different comorbidities, but younger, but their bodies are like old. Does that, does that make sense? Sure. You may have a young age, but your body may be old because it for many reasons, whether it's genetics or the environment that you, and the way you lived, but it's an old body. Those people don't do well. Those with hypertension, cardiac, diabetes, and obesity we're now seeing don't do well. So it, it's really coming back to a lot of the basics. Eat right, exercise out in the sun. Vitamin D, for some reason, seems to have some sort of protective factor with this particular disease. And uh, there are now studies being done with zinc back east with the same component. So keep your child at home avail, good nutrition, let them play out in the sun or sunscreen <laughs> because we have a lot of rays here in, in New Mexico. But, but the component is children are social creatures. We do want them to interact. The challenge I think when we start school is not bringing the kids as carriers back to grandma and grandpa. That's gonna be our challenge. Oh. So, and children a little older will be wearing their masks and they, they can't understand. It helps grandma and grandpa not get sick or if mom and dad happen to be sick or it's a cancer survivor, it helps them stay healthy. Kids understand those concepts. But um, thank God in New Mexico, our numbers have been low. In children, interesting enough, the symptoms start with gastrointestinal symptoms. It isn't the cough and the fever, you still see that, but kids tend to have more of a GI symptom with COVID. That's what the latest is showing right now. But again, we don't know how many kids already have had COVID or we don't know even enough. That's why the testing is so important. The tracing is so important. And we need to keep doing that and we'll be doing more of it as the days go on. But um, I think, I really believe for us in New Mexico, the worst has passed. It doesn't mean we slack off. It means we stay vigilant and we keep doing all the good things we're doing, but we keep doing things now in a different way and adapt to our new lifestyles. Thank you, doctor, so much. And you, you bring up a really great point. I, I wish we had so much more time, but you know, a lot of people feel like they had COVID way before COVID hit. So, I've heard that. Uh, you know, <laughs> so, you know, we, we feel like you could never have been sicker in your life. And, and you know, here we are. So, uh, but I, I think that that's really great information and in, in understanding tracing and how that works. And really it comes down to being informed and doing some research and, and really asking the right questions to the right people. So thank you so much for your information. Yeah. Maria and Jim. 
you guys have been out there. You've been on that front line the last two months. You know, um, just share with us some words of, of um, advice and inspiration. You're always so inspirational, Maria, in everything that you do. And, and we just appreciate you so much as a friend and, and not just a member, but also being out on those front lines. We can't say thank you enough, but please share with us um, some advice that you might give because we are your friends out here and we want to know, um, you know, we want to know. So share with us. I mean, I love everyone. I love people. I love Albuquerque. I love New Mexico. I love the fact that everyone who knew that I went back to nursing has been so supportive and very compassionate and kind. And what can we do to help out? And, and I see that with my coworkers as well. I see that also with my husband as well and his coworker in the emergency department. And yes, it's, 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 it's a new way of living, but uh, we just have to embrace it. And New Mexicans have show up, you know, and we're still showing up and we're still doing the best that we can, so. You know, the one thing that Americans tend to do is focus on the individual. And we're so concerned about individual rights and what, what, I, what I can do. And I think this brings us back to balance that it's important for us to also focus on the community. And the way that we get past this is while we're social distancing, we actually need to embrace each other even more and maybe in different and new ways. But the way we get through this is to work as a community. You wear your mask not to protect you, but to protect your community. You do these different things to protect our community. And the thing that's going to get us through this and continue to get us through this is us working together and, and protecting each other. That's what this really brings to form, for my, uh, the forefront. And as a small business owner, I want to say that we're so strong. You know, each one of these business owners that is out there, um, I mean, we've been through the ringer. I mean, it's, it cannot get any worse, let me tell you that. But I have seen every single business owner trying to help each other. I mean, where, where our spa is, I mean, all of us, each one of us, um, owners and you know on that center we have united we have seen um other marketing companies that we do business with being supportive and say hey girl i got you back radio stations um i mean it's been such an amazing support uh there have been also some negatives so some landlords that have not been really good but we're working on it. But overall, I think that we're powerful. We're the backbone of America and we're gonna come back stronger and better. And we know it, deep inside we know it and we're gonna do whatever it takes. Well, well said, Maria, and thank you. And yes, small business is going to come back stronger than ever. And um, I think that, you know, moving forward, um, <clears throat> that's what we do here at the Chamber is really do our best to support what you guys need. And uh, so we actually are starting a new program this week. I can't wait to share with you all. Uh, but it's uh, ready to open and uh, some initiatives that will help businesses really get focused on just some really simple basics, pretty much all we talked about today. And so um, to close up some of the key points that I think uh, are important to take away from today's webinar is, you know, don't delay. If you have a medical condition or a medical procedure, do not delay. Do not be fearful. Uh, visiting doctors or um, hospitals, uh, the best thing to do is um, learn all about telemedicine and find yourself a primary care or a doctor that, you know, you can build a relationship with in time. And, and even though it seems weird because we're distant, but we're really building different types of relationships now. And so I think we need to build on that. Um, I think uh, our, our families, uh, especially being, you know, uh, Hispanic family said it best, cleanliness is next to godliness growing up. And uh, we heard it all the time. So, you know, be, be very cognizant of how you are interacting with people. And, and, and I think uh, uh, Jim or Jeff said, you know, the constant surfaces that we touch, doorknobs and light switches and, and car door handles and steering wheels and just the different things that we touch and you know carrying your sanitizer around so make sure that you're staying safe and clean uh, that'll change everything not just covid that'll change all the things that were contagious uh around you know and and also um and hopefully help us 
in, in that aspect. And I think uh, the most important was the mental health awareness that we all need to understand that everybody is riding this storm a little bit different. Um, somebody said it well when they said we're in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And so I think it's important that we um, really be kind and patient to each other and um, you know understand that everybody has their own way of coping and or what they're dealing with um, to get us through COVID. So I want to say a huge thank you to our panelists today. It has been a joy. I wish that we could go on and on so many, so much more information. Questions continue to come in, um, but we are excited. Thank you so much uh, to, to everybody for joining us today. And I want to say a big thank you to New Mexico Mutual, our sponsor for our May webinar series. Uh, we we really appreciate your support of small business and New Mexico Tech uh, today to Shay and Noah behind the screen, uh, behind the screen, literally behind the scenes, behind the screen, and to Angelique um, in our department at the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber. Thank you guys so much. We will see you on Wednesday where we will tackle best practices from the regional leaders um, in the uh, chamber world. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys at noon on Wednesday. Everybody have a great day. Happy Monday Thank out you. there. Thank you, Shannon. Bye. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.